So today is named fluid flow, but really what we're talking about are the renewable forms of energy in terms of wind, hydroelectricity, and also wave and tidal generation. So everything today really is um, low carbon emitting and renewable forms of energy. But as you'll see, most of them have limitations in when they can deliver, also where they can be used, and they're not general, generally available in every single part of the world. So the things we're going to go through and you'll learn today, we're going to talk about very basic aspects of fluid flow. So streamlines, I'll give you Bernoulli's equation, but we're really only um, giving that to the people that haven't seen it before, and I'll explain what you need to understand. We'll also talk about how to calculate power and energy available from hydroelectric generation, how turbines work and how to choose the correct turbine for different applications, how to calculate the power and energy available from tidal generation schemes and some examples of those as well, and how wave energy can be used to generate electricity. We'll then talk, uh, the second part of the lecture really is all about wind and wind turbines and how they generate electricity. And throughout the lecture, we'll talk about some of the environmental issues with the renewable technologies in this lecture. So as you'll see, renewables are also controversial in some areas, particularly around wildlife and uh, the ecological um, impacts that some of these technologies can have. That's been a, a major problem, certainly in the UK, in some areas having these uh, renewable and low carbon generating technologies deployed. And I'm sure that's a common problem in many different parts of the world. So streamlines and mass continuity. So I'm, I'm well aware in this course that, that many people won't have done fluid flow. But when I talk about a fluid today, we could be talking about water and a lot of today will be water with hydro schemes uh, as well as waves. But we can also think of air as a, a non-compressible fluid. So a, a key assumption we're going to make is that whichever fluid we're looking at, whether that's water, air, or anything else, it's incompressible. And that means that the density, rho, is constant. Now this is to make the calculations easy. And anybody that does do a lot of work on fluid dynamics will understand that the minute you start to look at compressible fluids, the equations really become extremely difficult to solve and frequently are intractable to solve. So a streamline is a very basic concept here. What we have is a, a fixed amount of, of density of, of air or liquid flowing through a, a tube. Now, if, we, if, it's, if the water goes through this tube and it's got a velocity u1, and one end of the tube has an area a1, if we change the area of the other side to a2, there's going to be a different velocity for the water coming out. And in fact, the relationship between these two comes from um, Bernoulli's equation. And what it tells us is that the density times the velocity times the area is a constant. Now we have made the density constant. So actually the velocity times the area for what goes in at one side has to equal what comes out the other side. So if we want to find U2 over here and we know U1 and the areas at each side, U2 is just given by A1 divided by A2 times U1. So what we've got here is just one side of this is A2 U2 equals A1 U1, and then we move it around to solve for U2. So this is all very easy, and the level of, of fluid flow we really want to do in this course to allow you to be able to extract uh, equations that you can see how much energy is available for the different re renewable technologies. Now, I'm sure a number of you uh, will do Bernoulli's equation. This is the full version of Bernoulli's equation. And, and everything we have in terms of working at the energy today um, relates to Bernoulli's equation. So even when we start to look at hydro and the potential energy, 
that's part of what comes in here. But what we have is pressure divided by density plus gravitational acceleration times um, height or distance plus a half times the velocity squared has to equal a constant in different uh, schemes. Now here again, we're assuming an incompressible fluid and we're ignoring things like viscosity. So that's basically fluid drag as it flows through a pipe, through a river or um, through any other drag mechanism. Now for stationary incompressible fluids, we can set the velocity u equal to zero. And then this term um, comes out and we're just left with the, the pressure divided by the density plus the gravitational acceleration times the distance equals a constant. And this is frequently the one that's used for potential energy with hydro schemes to, to work out um, some of the key parameters. Well, let's give you uh, precise examples. So the first part of the lecture, we're going to go through different hydro electricity generation approaches. And where we want to start with is what really is, is the original use of, of water for powering just using a weir. So in fact, in Glasgow, just outside of the university on the River Kelvin, there are multiple weirs and a whole range from um, early milling for flour, uh, there's some pottery, and just using water and water wheels going over wheels, uh, going over weirs to actually extract the hydro energy into kinetic energy that could be used for uh, engineering and manufacturing purposes. Now, the amount of energy that's available, the first thing we need to look at is understand what the volume flow rate of the water is in these systems. And Francis first came up with a formula. What we have here is omega is the volume flow rate per unit width of this weir. Um, and that equals the gravitational acceleration. So that's going to be 9.81 meters per second squared. Well, it's actually the square root of that gravitational acceleration. And then times two thirds, this y min, well, that's basically the head of water above the top of the weir. Um, so this value here, y min, uh, times two thirds and then to the power of three over two will basically give you the volume flow rate going over the top of the weir. Now to show you a bit more modern over how river hydroelectric schemes uh, generate electricity, the equivalent to this is where you put a dam across a river and behind the dam in a reservoir, or it might just be a fast, fast flowing river, you will end up with a higher Y min with the water um, prevented from flowing down immediately being held back by the dam. You will have what's known as a penstock. There'll be a volume flow rate going through that penstock. And again, it's just given by this Francis formula that you can work out the flow rate going through here. You'll then have a turbine, you'll have a Faraday generator and directly generate electricity as the water flows uh, through this penstock. And ultimately we'll go out to a river, out to an ocean or to some area of water that is at lower height than before the dam. Now the, the other type of hydro scheme, um, you know, one extreme that we've just shown you is damming a river. The other extreme is where we take a, a reservoir, a lake or a loch if you're in Scotland, and it's at a much higher level than somewhere else that you can drop the water down. So this height ideally wants to be as high as possible. Now, when, when you do this, you can work out what the potential energy of storing this mass of water at a particular height actually is. And that, that energy can be released if you drop it through a turbine, just using the formula uh, potential energy equals the mass times the gravitational acceleration, so 9.81 meters per second squared, times the height. Now, the power from this comes directly from this equation. We need to divide the energy per unit time to actually get uh, a power. We're also going to change the mass into a density, but density is just mass over volume. 
Um, omega is volume of water per second. So these cancel out when we put them in to get us back to MGH. And we're also going to put in here the efficiency. So with all these standard energy or power equations, when you come to any power station, you also have to put in an efficiency at the front. So here we've got the power for a, um, a pump storage hydro scheme is the efficiency times the density. That's going to be the density of water times the gravitational acceleration. So 9.81 meters per second squared times the height of the upper reservoir times the volume flow rate of the water flowing through the turbines. Now, there are many examples where um, you can actually reverse this whole process. So if you do any calculations in this, you can end up having a very high power being generated, but you run out of water from the utter upper reservoir extremely quickly. And in most places, that's not replenished uh, fast enough for the level that people would really like to generate electrical power. So a good example here is the Kruichen hydro scheme. This is about 40 miles uh, northwest of Glasgow. It actually is one of the hydro schemes that powers Glasgow. And here it's a pump storage scheme. So this is the upper reservoir with a dam. Uh, the Kruichen Hill, so Ben Kruichen is up here. It has a, a height between the two reservoirs. So Loch Kruichen is 360 meters above that's down the bottom here that you can't see in the picture. At the maximum flow rate, um, this power station can produce 440 megawatts of power. And during the evening, what happens is that cheap nuclear energy off the national grid is taken and pumps the water from Loch Awe back up to uh, Loch Kruken so that the next day during peak uh, demand it can actually generate more electricity. In this case, only 10% of the water in the upper reservoir for generating electricity actually comes from rainfall. So this area has pretty high rainfall, um, over two meters per annum, and yet only 10% of the water for generating electricity directly comes from rainfall. The rest comes from pumping water uh, back up from the bottom reservoir. So here's the three different extremes of how you use hydro schemes. The first one is just a fast flowing river where the, the head or the height of, of water and therefore the potential energy we've got is quite low. But here you've got a fairly fast uh, volume flow rate. So the kinetic energy is much higher and the majority of electricity generated comes from the kinetic energy flowing through of the fast flowing river. If we go to the other extreme, we have a very high reservoir. The, the fast flow rate here to generate the kinetic energy in the turbine comes from the potential energy that is released when we drop this water over the large height. And then in between, you can basically have any, anything that's a combination between the potential energy and the kinetic energy, depending on um, what the local environment allows between rivers high reservoirs and so on. So a river with a high flow rate omega and a low height h can actually have the same power as a high reservoir with a low flow rate. So you know, many of these schemes actually generate as much power as you get with, with a high reservoir. So how do we extract the energy from the flowing water? Well, we have to use a turbine. And there are many different types of turbines. There's two particular ones that we need to be aware of. The first one is the impulse turbine. And this is typically where we've got very fast flowing water. We use um, a valve to actually um, get a higher velocity and then some cups that the water hits at high velocity and high pressure and the impulse on these cups drive round the turbine blades. So for the impulse turbines, the blades are typically in air and the thrust 
on the blades and to turn this turbine comes from impulse forces. At the opposite um, stage, we basically have reaction turbines. And these are where uh, the blades are actually immersed the whole time in water. Typically, rather than cups, we have uh, curved blades and the thrust comes from both a reaction component as well as an impulse component of the water directly hitting each of the blades. Now there's many, many, many other types of turbine blade design, but the reality is in terms of the physics of how you extract energy, you either have a pure impulse or a pure reaction and everything else is something in between using some impulse and some reaction. So let's calculate or at least um, derive the amount of energy or power that's available from an impulse turbine, what in fact is known as a Pelton wheel after the original inventor. So here we basically have um, a, a valve. These are set up with something that reduces the, the internal volume and that allows the velocity coming out of here to increase. It will then come out and actually hit a cup that's connected to a wheel that will rotate. And typically in most of these systems, you want just a one uh, jet of water coming in. You'll have either two or multiple jets of water to increase the impulse and increase the extraction of energy from the, the flowing water. So the cup here, we're going to give it a, a velocity UC and U is the velocity of water coming in. Now the mass of the water striking each cup, well, um, mass is, is, sorry, density is mass divided by volume. And then if we include the volume flow rate, this basically uh, relates into the volume flow rate we can measure uh, coming out of each of these water jets. So in reality, th this is called a spear valve and it controls the velocity coming out over the size of the hole. And this controls the volume inside. So just as I showed earlier over our um, fluid flow and looking at um, the different tubes, by changing the area here, we can increase the velocity quite substantially if this area is decreased relative to the area down here. The cups, rather than this simple drawing I have here, typically actually have two parts. And what they do is they try and turn the water back so that the velocity of the water um, is the same, but it just changes direction by 180 degrees. Now you'll see why that's important in a moment. Now, in fact, the, the relative velocity that's reflected, this cup is going to be moving. So the velocity reflected is U minus UC because the, the cup's moving. And because it's changing direction and coming backwards, we've got a minus two in here. So because we change direction, it's basically twice the value that we've got here. So this is one of the tricks that's used in the Pelton wheel to increase significantly the effect of velocity. And in fact, this velocity, because the water goes one way and then comes back, is equivalent to the acceleration of the cup. So because it's equivalent to the acceleration, we can use force equals mass times acceleration, just Newton's second law. So the force in the cup is going to be this value times the mass of the water striking the cup. Well, that's our density times our volume flow rate. So now we've got twice the density times the volume flow rate and U minus UC. So for the force here, the velocity has a minus, but for the acceleration, it's just the absolute value of the velocity that we've got here, simply because the, the water is changing direction. Now, if we want to find the power, we need to take the force and multiply by the velocity of the cup. So we just take this equation and multiply it by UC, and we end up with this equation for the power. Now, that's not the maximum power, and there's a number of parameters in here that make it more difficult to, to estimate the maximum output power. And you have to measure many more parameters than you would like. So what we do 
to find the maximum power is we want to look for the stationary points in, um, in this equation. To do that, we differentiate the power with respect to the velocity of the cup and set that to zero. And it's fairly easy if you use a substitution to show that, in fact, the solution that happens when uc equals a half u, that gives you the maximum power coming out of this equation. So the maximum power, if we substitute this in here, is a half times the density. So if that's water, that's just a thousand kilograms per cubic meter times the volume flow rate times the velocity of the water squared that comes out of the spear valve. So in fact, this is just a half uh, mass times velocity squared, like the kinetic energy. But because we've got the volume flow rate, it's divided by time. So really, it, it is equivalent to kinetic energy or kinetic power, if you like. So the maximum output is just the kinetic energy incident on the cup per second. So let's show you what some of these real uh, turbines look like. This is a Francis reaction turbine. This is probably the most common that's used in hydro schemes. So you've got the flow of water coming in, you've got the curved uh, blades and cups, and water comes out, and the blades are completely immersed in water. In fact, these, what you have is also, uh, you have these veins that control the angle of the water coming in, and depending on the volume flow rate, you can change these to maximize the output power in the system. The, the other type of um, typical turbine is the Kaplan turbine. This is used for low heads and fast flowing. So if you've dammed a river and a fast flowing river, it's typically a Kaplan uh, turbine that's going to be used, whilst the Francis turbine um, is typically the one used for um, where you have reservoirs and a high head of water. Now there's many different types of turbines and this slide just gives you an example of six, but you'll find in many different countries and different places, there's a lot of different uh, varieties of turbines that have been designed and actually used in, in different places. So which turbine do you pick? Well, I've, I've already given some examples, but you can see here, here is the head of water. This is in a logarithmic scale. And here's the volume flow rate uh, in meters cubed per second. And so if you've got a high head of water, it's a Pelton or one of the turbo impulse turbines that I showed in the previous slide. Whilst if we have a low head of water and we have a very high flow rate, it typically is the propeller type or the Kaplan turbine blades uh, that are used. Um, and much, whilst if, if we're looking at something in between, it's the Francis and similar, where it's a mixture of reaction and impulse. So down here, it's predominantly reaction. Up here, it's predominantly impulse. And in the middle, we have something that's a, a compromise and a balance with both reaction and impulse. So there are many examples of hydro schemes around the world. And I'm sure many of the, the people on this course from different countries um, some countries may not have hydro because of the environment, but the majority do where it's used. In Scotland, there are now 58 hydro schemes, many different examples. A lot of them are actually um, over a century old. So here is one that's uh, up at Pitlochry, uh, north of Perth. So this is about an hour and a half drive away from Glasgow. And one of the problems on this particular river, the head in terms of the dam is about 15 meters. It's actually got nine different uh, dams across the river uh, for this particular hydro scheme. There were enormous problems when uh, this was considered because this is a river that salmon fish swim up it and then spawn uh, laying eggs for the, the next generation um, at the top of the river. Now, the big worry was with a 15 meter high dam is salmon are, are excellent at jumping up waterfalls, but they can't jump 15 meters. 
So instead, what was done at the, at the time of building this was there was built what's now known as the Pitlochry fish ladder. And you can go, this is actually um, a tourist um, event that you can go and see. There's actually some glass windows. And if you go at the time that the fish are swimming up, you can actually see the fish swimming up and um, an ecology team is there all the time and actually count the number of fish that swim up the fish ladder. You can also see there's actually holes in this with the water flowing down, but some of the fish jump over um, each of these steps. So it's a little bit like having uh, steps going up um, and this is over about a hundred meters and each of the steps is only a few cent uh, tens of centimeters. So the fish can easily jump and come up these, or the 15 meter dam, it would be impossible for them to get up. So when you build hydro schemes, it's typically the ecological and environmental impacts you have to worry about. In this case, it's a 15 milli, uh, megawatt power station, and it's part of a complete 235 megawatt with the nine joined uh, dams in this particular um, system. And there's five different fish ladders for five of the dams. Now, what the monitoring of this has shown is that if you consider the ecology and you build things like fish ladders, there's no adverse effects on the fish at all. But if you don't consider these things, you can really wipe out complete species in particular areas. So this is not the only problem with dams. Um, sadly, in Brazil, two years ago, there was um, a dam which wasn't uh, correctly built and correctly maintained. It collapsed and actually killed 259 people. So 11 people are missing and were never found after that disaster. And you can see here a picture taken afterwards that the dam was actually up here and you can see the devastation. In fact, there was a village further down that was completely swept away. Laos, there was another accident in July 2018. So you might consider hydro schemes as renewable and a safe form of energy. If you don't maintain dams and look after these schemes, they can be dangerous and they can lead to fatalities as well. So how much hydro um, is actually used around the world? Well, it's actually pretty big. It's something around 15.8% um, of the global production of electricity came from hydro schemes in 2018. So you can see it's actually pretty big and it accounts for over 70% of all the renewable electricity generation in the world. Now, China actually is the highest number of hydro schemes and um, there's many other countries around the world. You can see here uh, some of the biggest are also put in. So India, Russia, Sweden, Japan, Venezuela, US. Most of these countries have natural resources and an environment that hydro is an easy form of energy to use. Now in total, you can see here, um, it turns out to be, uh, sorry, this is slightly wrong. It, it's 116, um, megawatt hours of electricity is in a, a toll. And in, you can see that we're talking about something around a thousand megatoes is actually produced every year in terms of the energy. If you want to look up where this data came from, uh, BP actually have this excellent website that give you uh, statistics on the use of energy and the generation of energy and the sources, fuels and renewables um, from all around the world. So hydro, so there are both pros and cons. It's a true renewable. It's very low in carbon emissions in the majority of the time. Now you've got to be a little bit careful here. So particularly where dams are built and you flood valleys, there is a lot of CO2 that can come out initially over the first 15 to 20 years and methane in particular from the decay of vegetation underwater. Now, in reality, if you have dams and they're well built and maintained, the lifetime of hydro schemes can be uh, certainly well over 
hundreds of years. So overall, it's still a very low CO2 um, emitting form of electricity generation. Small scale and large scale work extremely well. And the generation efficiencies, as we saw in the first lecture, are typically always over 90%. So compared to thermal schemes, the efficiency of taking the energy that's available and turning it into electricity is very high. But what are the disadvantages? Well, whilst electricity might be very cheap if you run these schemes for a long period of time, building a dam typically is a very high initial capital cost and also putting the, uh, the turbines and the generators in has a high initial upfront cost. The turbines and generators typically have to be replaced around every 25 to 30 years. Um, I'll talk a bit more about some of the tidal schemes where sometimes they have to be replaced a bit more, but certainly most of the, the hydro we're talking about, 25 to 30 years, you need some major maintenance on the turbines and um, generators. The, the key problem and why more hydro is not typically used is you need the natural environment for good hydro. So it doesn't work everywhere. There's potential environmental issues with fish. Um, it can be solved, but it may increase costs. There's also um, a number of other potential issues. For example, the Nile, the River Nile in Africa, there are arguments between countries where a country upstream uh, wants to build dams and that potentially can actually change drinking water and irrigation water for farming in countries that are further uh, down the river. So there are arguments between some African countries, such as um, Egypt and Kenya, over whether Kenya should be allowed to build dams for hydroelectric generation. And also, there is the potential for displacement of people um, so there may be villages in, or towns in ideal places for um, building a dam and flooding to allow you to generate hydroelectricity. China, for some of their enormous hydro schemes, displaced whole cities to actually allow the building of some of their hydro schemes. There are examples in the UK where villages had to be uh, completely removed um, because all the homes in those villages were um, put under water after dams were built. So there's, you know, there's a whole series of society issues that also have to be thought about when you put hydro into place. And as you can see here, you might think that a low carbon emitting form of electricity generation is great and a renewable form is great, but to actually deploy it, there could be many society challenges to actually build these things, use them, and you know, society agree that they should be built in use. Okay, this is a good place to have a break. So what I'll do is I will stop the recording.